who's doing more effort. All you're doing is not spending effort solving the customer's problems. You're doing everything you can to lose the deal at that point, as opposed to win the deal. So once you agree to do a deal with a partner, then then everybody gets comped, everybody wins together, and 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 we'll hold the partner accountable. If if we feel that the partner is is uh, not pulling their weight in that deal, then we just want to involve them in the next deal. It's as simple as that. All right, we're back at last. Welcome to the Nearbound Podcast. Isaac, how you doing today, my man? Doing great. Doing great, man. Excited to be back uh, back at it. Um, I feel like it's not quite the same since we just had an in-person recording. It's a little weird, again, being, you know, not sitting across the table from you, but it's fun to mix it up. So I'm ready. Yeah, we have a we have a fun guest today, um, which I've interacted with. Gosh, probably one of my first like tech experiences. Um, we have Clint Oram from Sugar CRM CSO over there. So Clint, welcome to the Nearbound Podcast. Hey guys, glad to be here. Um, well, I, I have this quick little anecdote because um, I've played around with virtually every CRM under the sun. Like really, I have like from. Pipe drive to Prosperworks, which is now Copper, to Insightly, to you know, Nimbly, to you name it, you know, to High Rise, which we'll get to, you know, later, which is no longer around, Salesforce, HubSpot, you name it. But I remember my first CRM implementation, my very first one, and it was Sugar. And I installed it on a virtual machine and like we were running it inside of a um, I had a client in my marketing agency that was like, Hey, can you help us figure out our data? And so it was actually kind of through this partnership open source thing back in the early 2010s, I believe, where we set up Sugar. And I was an unbeknownst, you know, unbeknownst to me, I was kind of a partner, so to speak, in open source. Right. And um, I think as a company, Sugar, y'all have just such a unique partner story that kind of starts yeah. with open source. And I, I'd love to kind of start there. Um, how did Sugar come about open source versus kind of today, that, that trajectory, that story, Clint? Yeah. Okay. Let's go back to 2004. Uh, three of us were working together at another CRM company called Epiphany. It was John Roberts, Jacob Taylor, and myself. And uh, John and I were in the product management team and Jacob was in the engineering team. And and John and I went out to lunch. Actually, just to, to pause here for a second. By the way, yesterday was our 20-year anniversary from starting the Sugar wow. Journey. Whoa. So, so this is... Uh, this is a bit of a celebratory week for me. Balloons. Twenty years no, on the sugar journey. That's yeah, a good milestone. Yeah, yeah. And, and always, people always say to me, "April first? Why did you choose April first? It's kind of a weird date because it <laughs> sounds like the beginning of an April Fool's joke." And it all just just happened to be the day because we quit our jobs and and got started on sugar uh, April first, two thousand four. Incorporated the company on June first, so the company anniversary is in a couple months. But my my anniversary is today. Uh, yeah, I got there. real quick. To, I'm yeah. sorry, this is a sidetrack, but I you couldn't bet. help it when you said we quit our jobs April 1st. So I've been married for 20 years. For every year for that 20 years, every April 1st, I call my wife or text her and pretend that I got fired from my job, <laughs> which was particularly hard for like the 10 years where I was running my own company. I had to get really creative in the ways that yeah. I was like, you know, the company. And the, she has believed me like 80% of the time, which is terrifying including just yesterday i'm like honey it's over at reveal she's like what what happened <laughs> so uh that doesn't have anything to do with anything but it just reminded me continue with your your story well, right right on that it's a bit of a segue in there the only reason we could do what we did was because our, our three wives basically supported the families and and kept things going right so we we quit our jobs in in um in march started on sugar in april and the story is, you know, kind of cool. So John Roberts uh, and I were, we, we shared a cube. We worked together, right? And we went out to lunch on, I, and these, these dates are burned into my memory. June 19th, 2004, he said, hey, let's go have some lunch. I got an idea for you. He pitched the idea of open source CRM to me. Um, we we're walking back from the, from the restaurant to our office, and I'm looking at him going, I'm going to do this. So that was January. Uh, Come March, we had pitched the idea to the first VC who who said to us in this very polite way, interesting idea. You've given me a lot to think about. <laughs> and, 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 and we took that as the most enthusiastic support. Oh, she's ready to invest. We're quitting our jobs. And, and little did we know that was the standard. Thank you for coming by. And there's the door answer 
that VC is Let, let me know how I can be helpful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. So we, we got started, uh, started writing code. Jacob and I started writing code right away in April. We started posting our code up to SourceForge, if you remember SourceForge, wow. the, the epicenter of open right. source software for such a long time. Uh, quickly uh, rocketed up to the top of the download ranks. We were uh, pitching Sugar Serum to a group of VCs at a, a, a summer showcase event, the Software Developer Forum Summer Showcase, June 4th, 2004. And there was a VC in the crowd and he loved our idea. And a couple of weeks later, he gives us a term sheet. Uh, that was a fun story, signing the term sheet with Tim Draper of Draper Fisher Jurvetson as he was standing in line ordering a pitcher of beer and, and a hamburger at the uh, Dutch Goose restaurant in, in Palo Alto, in no, Menlo Park, I think it is. So yeah, he, he was standing there in line saying, hey, you guys gonna make me some money? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, let me sign this $2 million term sheet for you guys. And then he went back to order his pitcher of beer and, and, a, and a hamburger. So what, what was the, how were you going to make him money? What was the business model? So yeah. So the, the whole business models. model in there and, and, you know, fast forward to the end of the year, at the end of that first year, we started selling in October and October to, to, to December 31st, we sold $250,000 worth of software. So we went from concept in January to, to, um, fully funded company, uh, uh 12 employees and 250,000 in revenue in 12 months. And what we did is we sold, um, premium version of the, of the software on top of it. So the free version, open source, download, use it for free. And then when you're ready for uh, more functionality, when you're ready for a team to support you in what you're doing, you came and you bought software from us. Talk about an ecosystem play from day one, right? Like you have a, an ecosystem of people who are, who are passionate about open source software, people who just want to be able to get their own CRM and have control over it. Like the fact that you gave this, the base of it away sounds so like scary and risky, certainly to most VCs, but I think it probably gave you an instant ecosystem of people who are fans and, and, you know, who are building on it themselves. And that's, that's who you're going to sell to. It did. And, and, you know, freemium at its core is, is a pretty well understood uh, go to market model. And, and in the, in the end, when we described it that way to the VCs, they, they, they understood what we were talking about, no doubt about it. But what happened, you know, and in the world of open source, you talk about community, the open source community is, is the group of developers who come together to make a product better, who evangelize the product, who talk about the product. And we really wanted to tap into that community because what we had been doing in our previous jobs, we had been working with partners developers, uh, uh, um, basically system integration shops that were implementing in our software at our previous company. And we looked at them and said, oh, we can turn them into open source developers. We can turn them into an open source community. And sure enough, when we, when we released our software, within, within a few days of releasing the second version of our software, this company reached out to us from France and they said, hey, by the way, we translated your software into French. Oh, we didn't really set it up to be translated. Good on you. And then secondly, uh, we'd love to be a partner of yours and represent you in France. Oh, okay, there we go. We're, we're off to the races. And so we had uh, our first partner reaching out to us in July. We had them signed up in a couple months and we started our partner program. And that's been a, a core part of how we have been making companies successful with our software in the last 20 years is working with those partners. I love that moment you described where someone came to you. Cause I, I always say internally to our team that I did is better than we should, right? Instead of coming and saying, Hey, we should do this thing. It's always better when you can say, Hey, here's what I did. Yeah. What's cool about the open source model is instead of a company coming to you and saying, Hey, would you be able to make a French version? We'd like to use your product. Can you do that? And then you got to make the decision. Is it worth it for us to put in this for them to come and say, Hey, we already did this because they have that capability because you've yeah. open sourced it. And now you're like, oh, wow, thank you. You just made this more valuable. How can we partner? I, I love that. That's such a cool moment. Well, that's what got us started. And, and um, you know, fast forward to where we are today, uh, hundreds of customers, uh, excuse me, hundreds of partners worldwide. Um, uh, oh, well over half of our revenue is happening through our partner reseller community. Uh, we're, we're, as we think about growth ahead of us, we're specifically focusing on the ecosystems of other uh, adjacent software to us and mm. we're partnering with those companies and just the way we think about every aspect of how we go to market uh, partners are quarter and and it's not just 
you know, I actually spent a lot of time talking about when you say partner, do you mean reseller? Do you mean distributor? Do you mean system <laughs> integration partner? Because we have all those different types of partners inside of Sugar. There, I have so many questions, Clint. There, there are so <laughs> many timeless lessons in what you just said that I think apply today in Sugar's journey, mm -hmm. but then for like the modern business. So um, I'm just going to start going through some of them that I was kind of unpacking. Jared was typing me bullet points for himself in the chat, like of things he wants to ask you about. Yeah. And the list just kept growing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because, right on. because there's so many timeless things though, that like, you know, what's, what, what worked once is working again, albeit in a new fashion. I mean, PLG is all the rage for entrepreneurs exactly. and it's like, well, yeah, this is product led growth at its core. Yeah, we didn't even know that was called product led growth, but it, that's what we were it doing. It wasn't, it definitely wasn't then. Right. Like you, but you, yeah, you had that there. model and the, the kind of the point was, what, what I'd love to hear kind of maybe the first thing to educate some folks on is these different business models. We get myopically focused in the SaaS world on like, oh, there's just one. You sell a license, right? Um, but the difference between like, let's say open source versus perpetual license and monetization. Open source for you all in the beginning was just the free version. Then in the beginning, you had a license and was it perpetual or was it SaaS? It was always uh, a subscription. Always so, SaaS. So, yeah, uh, from the beginning and and in there, uh, you know, I, I think about lots of things that the, the market was changing back then uh, in 2004. There was a lot of backlash to traditional enterprise software. And out of that came the subscription billing model. Out of that came uh, software as a service. So I actually kind of I separate subscription billing from software as a service because when I run the software for you, uh, I'm delivering it as a service to you. And, and I can deliver that soft software to you either as a subscription billing model, which makes sense, especially when I'm running the software for you, or I could deliver as a perpetual model. So that kind of separate those two. And then open source, the try before you buy. So those were three things that, that we embraced right out of the gates. So even when we had on-premise software, right? And, and we still have uh, uh, customers who are running Sugar on-premise. We've always approached them from a subscription billing model. And whether they're, uh, and then if for us, when I say SaaS, I'm thinking about the Sugar Cloud and how we deliver the software for them. And, and so I kind of separate those out into three different buckets. Okay, perfect. So then the, my next follow on question is because I remember building the PandaDoc and uh, Sugar uh, integration back in the day. And I, I went to SugarCon, mm -hmm. like I had some amazing partners. So shout out to like um, David Fay with um, Fay Business Systems. Like I remember interacting with Sugar Partners and I always loved Sugar Partners. I thought y'all had the best partners of anyone that I worked with in CRM space. They're um, a fun group. Yeah, amazing, amazing group in, across the board. I could name drop so many Sugar Partners here. Um, one of the things that I was curious about is from a platform perspective, when you open source and you put things out there versus having APIs, I also thought you were a little bit ahead of the curve or actually, frankly, really ahead of the curve when it came to your API availability and extensibility of sugar. Mm -hmm. What about that having open source at your core made it easier or harder to have that platform and API kind of focus for people to build into sugar or for you to do more creative partnerships, which we'll get into later, like powered by partnerships. I'd love to hear about that distinction, open source yeah. and API. How do they? Yeah, I, I would that? say it's, it's not, a, it makes it easier. I'd say it's a must have, you have to do it. When, when you design a product that is meant to be extensible by developers so that they can do things on top of it, if you don't have it well designed for that extensibility, if you don't have those APIs in place, you're just going to have spaghetti code in the end and, and trying to manage spaghetti code is, is impossible. So we, we recognize right out of this. And frankly, we, we were taking our, our cues from other open source projects, right? So back in the day, there was Mambo, there was Drupal, there was WordPress, there was uh, LifeRay, there was all these open source CMS products that were quite successful at running websites for people, but nobody was doing open source CRM. And, and we really got the, the jump on the market from that perspective. But we were looking at these other open source business apps and saying, ah, APIs, got to do it that way. Back then in the early, early days, it was it was SOAP APIs, uh, then yep. evolved to REST APIs. Yes. Yep. And, um, and designing your software even down to, at the functional level so that uh, you've got a declared set of, of, of code level functions that are or objects that are meant to be APIs and, ver and others that are that are closed or private uh, functions that that was all important uh, to design your product that way, because otherwise you just couldn't realistically engage a developer community, they they'd get frustrated with you for creating something that that resulted in spaghetti code. Well, Clinton, in, in 
your experience, you've seen companies come and go in the past, you know, 20 years of sugar, lots of companies come and go, right? The startup failure rate is, you know, high, you know, you're, you're in the middle of the valley. You had, you know, uh, Tim Draper involved in your seed round, right? Um, the, why, why so few, why do so few companies operate that way? Right? Like why don't more companies today embrace that model? It feels like if you want to win today, API first, kind of opening it up and saying, hey, here's the, the open source code. Here's how much you can do that. I mean, if you look at some of the most popular, um, actually, GPT, LLM, rifts and things happening right now, some of them are open source, actually, right? They're platforms. Yeah. Right, they're platforms. What's the reticency or the, the hesitancy of founders from your kind of, you know, your view as to why they wouldn't? Well, I, I think the core of it comes down to uh, time, money, and focus, right? So, so in there, when you're building a platform and you're uh, uh, building in a set of APIs, you're, you're, you're playing the long game. You're, you're intending to specifically build an ecosystem around you. And, and I found that a lot of founders, it's just kind of the psyche of the founder to want to control things. And a lot of founders who, who don't uh, appreciate the value of it. Well, let me say it differently. Part of the whole mindset of building a partner led go to market model is to not have control, to let go, right? Uh, um, to, to take a step back and say, I'm building something and I'm encouraging others to come in and build on top of it and, and to build around it. And, and the core of that is the idea of letting go and and enabling others to, to drive success. And I found that a lot of a lot of founders don't have that um, mindset. You know, they they tend to be a bit more me first. They tend to be very control command control centric. And if anything, it's probably one of the biggest reasons why companies fail early is because the founder team is so command control centric that they. Um, they kind of work themselves into a corner and, and they, they're not hiring the right people around them. They're not bringing in the right partners around them. They, they can't appreciate the value of an ecosystem and they just kind of wither on the vine and die away. You know, the thing that comes to mind is like, this is a yes. And so I, I actually agree with what you just said. And I also find somewhat the opposite to be true is that mm -hmm. uh, a lot of founders have shiny object syndrome, SOS, right? Mm -hmm. And they don't necessarily have product market fit, or even if they have a business doing 10, 20 million in revenue, they're kind of struggling to find that next thing. And versus that being emergent to them, to your point that they kind of have this control, they actually don't have a concrete vision of what the next phase of their application looks like. So they're waiting for those opportunities to be magically, you know, come from their product team or from some, you know, feedback session or some survey. But it doesn't empower them to actually build the platform and the architecture that's like, hey, that underlines and supports it. So for instance, you probably had a decent idea of what the objects looked like, right? And the data model and things like that kind of out the gate for CRM. And then you go out and build a new SaaS application and you're like, okay, we're thinking design first. We're thinking UI, we're thinking workflow, but they're not typically thinking data model. They're thinking customer outcome. Like, what can I do for the customer? So I see a little mm -hmm. bit of yes and. Um, yeah, let, let me, let me twist that a little bit. Let me, let me take, I, I like where you're going with that idea, Jared. Let me, let me, let me shape it a little bit differently. So, so to build a successful company, you need to be able to do two things. You need to be able to create a killer product and you need to be able to create customers that are loyal. Right. Yep. And, and, and so many founders are, are totally product centric and, and they do know how to create a killer product, but they don't know how to create loyal customers. And, and, and when I say create loyal customers, I'm talking about everything from marketing to sales to, to customer success, to customer service, all those pieces coming together. And, and a lot of founders get so focused on building an awesome product that, and, and they have such a command control mentality around them that they don't know how to either build a go-to-market model that, that creates loyal customers, or they don't know how to hire people to do that as well. And so, um, and, and that's, that's where I just fundamentally see so many companies failing and, 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 or, or startups uh, failing early is the, that lack of understanding how to create loyal customers. And, and an ecosystem approach is, is a time proven, extremely effective approach to, to creating loyal customers. There's other models in there as well. There's other pieces to come together, but that lack of understanding of how to create customers, that, that's a problem. It, it's interesting. There's kind of like a tendency, I think, 
it, maybe you tell me if, if this checks out, but for founders, for early stage companies to think, yeah, 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 yeah. We'll, we'll get to that stage where we're doing a bunch of ecosystem stuff. Like that's where we get to eventually. But at first we have total control over the product. We build the product. We have our nice go-to-market motions, which are kind of your standard, you know, sales driven. And we're getting out there. Once we get like a stable customer base, we've got, now we start to go and think about integrations and partners. And then eventually we think about it as a platform and we get to the, the ecosystem nirvana that we all want to get to where revenue is being driven by all these other people. But it's like, that comes later. First, we got to have total control. And there's something, there's like a whole different approach that needs to happen. If you want to think from the get-go, you know, you, you mentioned WordPress, some of these other successful open source things where it's like, hey, the product, if it's open source from the get-go, the, the product itself, it's not like, okay, it's fully formed. We put our go-to-market together. We get all this stuff established. These things are messier at first because they're mm -hmm. kind of the, the customer and the ecosystem. They're all involved in the process as it's going. And there's the feedback loops are shorter but it's also messier. You kind of have to have patience. And like you said, that kind of like not having control, but it gets you to that. It gets you to that state where you can start to grow in, in amazing ways and tap into the power of ecosystems faster. And I think when, when you tell yourself you'll do it later, it's really hard to do it later because you get sort of dependent that path dependency. So anyway, I, I, Jared, I know you and I not on the product side, yeah. but an analogy to that with sort of community and content, we were like, Hey, we really want to be playing around in this partnerships ecosystem space. There's something happening here, but like, what's the, what's the product? Not sure. There's a couple different ideas. What if we, what if we don't even have to answer that question? What if we punt on that and let's build the audience first, right? Let's yeah. go be in the market and build a community around a set of ideas. I, I got to tell you, I, I look at what next. you guys are doing with the Nearbound pro, uh, podcast and, and the company Reveal Beyond, and I think you guys are, are leading the charge of how a modern software company gets created. So so remember back, I told you we raised that $2 million in seed funding, and, and the first five people we hired, we hired three developers, of course. We hired somebody to support our open source community and we hired somebody to run marketing, right? And in fact, the first person to, to sign on the dotted line to become an employee of Sugar Serum was Tara Spalding and she ran marketing for us. And, 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 I, and I call that out because so many great software products die early because nobody knows about them, right? And, and hiring that marketing person and she, she's the one that really spearheaded creating the sugar community, right? So my job was to interface with the community and, and be the community leader as, as a founder. And I, and I had Julian, who was uh, working with me on doing that as the support guy, right? He was answering technical questions. And then I had Tara working with me, uh, um, creating the buzz, creating the noise, getting us into into events and, and, and interviews and all those types of things. And, and none of that... Uh, I, I, I honestly say today that Sugar wouldn't be what it is if it wasn't for Tara and everything that she was doing from the marketing angle to build community around us, uh, because we would have just been a bunch of smart nerds hanging out with our code, wondering when somebody was going to download something next. Right. And um, what? just a quick thing to call out, too, is that that background from Epiphany, I think, is so important because Tara was from Epiphany as well, right? That's right. So yeah. I, Jocko Vanderkoij, we had on the podcast a, while, a little while ago, winning by design. So one of the SaaS go to market kind of consultants, big figures, um, crazy dude. I love him. Um, one of the things that he called out was like the only thing that you that is going to be defensible kind of here forward is a deep customer understanding, right? Yeah. It's not that you went and started another company in a space that you were unaware of. It's that you had this deep passion for this space. And you had some conviction about what you were doing. And these were lived experiences by really the whole team, the founders, and then your, you know, first employee, you know, um, your VP of corporate marketing. So I, I absolutely love that. Um, Isaac, you had a follow on question. Well, I guess there's, there's several, I'm, I'm, my mind's bouncing all over the place, but um, I'm curious, Clint, like, cause as I think through companies that I have observed kind of go to market this way, you like you'll see this, for instance, a lot around if you if you hang around sites like Product Hunt, where um, people that launch things there and there's kind of a robust community there of people that are like willing to test and play around with early products or in the the low code or no code community. 
a lot of products kind of launch in ecosystem with a lot of feedback all along the way, mm -hmm. there seems to be this like ceiling, like it's really hard for those companies to, to get big, right? Like it's really, it's a great way to like get out there with those rabid early adopters and get to like, Hey, this is a nice thing. This is real. This is a business. What do you think is the thing that can get you beyond that? It's like, I don't know. Is it one of those, like what got you here won't get you there sort of yeah. thing? Well, you, you got to build something that's valuable, right? I said, build a killer product. That's, that's the beginning of every company is build a killer product. And, and what's the definition of a killer product is, well, it needs to be solving a real pain point, right? And, and this is the part that I think we were, um, you know, we, we latched on to a, a great idea early is we're helping companies grow. That's what we do with CRM. And tell me, is there any company in the world that that's not thinking about how they grow? Is there any company in the world that's not thinking about how they manage their customers and interact with their customers? So we, we, we definitely tapped into the right, uh, the right idea at the right time. And I think that's, that's something that, that every founder has to be really brutally honest with themselves about is, is are they building something that's, that's useful, that's helpful, that's, that's valuable in the end. And, uh, um, you know, the part that I, that I love about uh, innovation is, is we're always pushing the envelope and thinking about that and, and rethinking what, what we were, you know, take something like DoorDash. Okay, a food delivery service, who cares about that, right? Or, or Uber, another taxi service, do we really need that? You bet we did, <laughs> right? So, so the whole idea of, of, are you building something valuable? Do you have a unique approach to it? Are you solving a real pain point? Um, I think that the, the awesome, I, there's nothing that excites me more than to hear tell, somebody tell me, oh, that's a stupid idea. Oh, I'm going to prove you wrong. Right? <laughs> that, that, that's, ooh, uh, that's, thank you for the challenge. When, when people tell me, oh, that's a really awesome idea everybody else is doing, eh, well, you know, there's, you know, there's probably about 10 other innovate uh, entrepreneurs ahead of me that are that are already working on the idea but when somebody says nah i don't like that idea but, uh, but i'm at the in my brain i'm saying no i can really change the market with with this idea that's that's the beauty of of i don't know silicon valley the american dream all those great ideas right that's the that is the founder dna right there when when no gets you excited yeah absolutely absolutely so if we if we go through the sugar journey clint um at some point, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Sugar's no longer, you're no longer focused on open source, but you still have perpetual, right? And clients, you know, install that and you help that with your ecosystem partners internally mm -hmm. and externally. Mm -hmm. um, so you're primarily, you know, uh, subscription billing to your point, whether that's perpetual um, or, mm -hmm. or cloud hosted. And there had to have been things that changed about your partner strategy. I'm sure there were some partners that were like, ah, I can't believe you did that. You know, like mm -hmm. we really love building, you know, this way or what have you. Talk to me about kind of like that next inflection point in the partner journey for Sugar from your vantage point, like beginning open source really kicked it off. You don't have open source anymore. What was that next inflection point where you felt like, okay, this was, this is something different now than what we started with? Well, you know, you're always driving growth. You're always thinking what the next stage of growth looks like ahead of you and, and what's the go to market model to, to make that happen. And, and what we, I think in the early days, what we benefited from is is we we kind of created our own gravity, our, our our own pull for people to us. People, they, there's a certain uh, technology savvy early adopter group of people out there that were seeking out open source software that that came to open source software, and here we were the leaders in open source CRM, and we were the obvious choice to to, to rally around. But you know that 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 early adopter uh, uh, group of of buyers out there or, or software users, that's only going to take you to a certain level of growth. After that, you've got the late majority, right? You got to cross the chasm, right? And and you've got to get to you got to get to people who who are not necessarily going to be uh, hanging out on on a on SourceForge or or uh, or other product development sites looking for the latest and greatest thing. They're looking for something that's proven, that's time tested. Uh, maybe they're, they're looking to, to their peers in their industry, what software are using. So we had to grow beyond just open source as that core message. And we had to become a CRM company, right? You know, and, and the way I kind of describe that journey for us is that we were, we were initially, we were an open source company that happened to do CRM. We had to become a CRM company that happened to do open source. Mm -hmm. And then we just had to become a CRM company. 
And, and what you find in there is that on that uh, product journey, maybe somewhere around that 50 to $100 million in revenue, people want to know that you know how to solve their business problems as the main reason why they want to work with you. And then the technology approach is kind of a secondary aspect. In those early days, when you're growing from zero to five million, you get to, you get to tap into those early adopters who want to geek out on technology and, and they're, they, they understand the, the value of the product right away, but they're looking for the hottest and latest and greatest technology. So it's just kind of a natural evolutionary growth. You know, you look at, at um, pretty much every company out there that has crested past that maybe $100 million in revenue point, they, they start talking more about what problems they're solving as opposed to how they're solving them. Right. And if you if you look at your different partner types now, um, I, I noticed this because it's a little, you know, every company tells them a little bit different. We could sit and actually go back and forth on what is a partnership? What kind of partnership are you talking about? You have two that you call out and there's actually obviously three with um, integration partners that are, let's say, you know, PandaDoc, like I mentioned, right? The one that I mm -hmm. helped build. Um, you have what you call solution partners and then you have reseller partners. Mm -hmm. But what I want to ask you a question about, reseller partners are also doing services and solutions. Of course. Right. Yeah. So wh why the distinction between solution and reseller partners? Is this merely a, a function of the transaction or is there something? Deeper? I got to tell you, so every, in, in our world, partnerships always started with the solution partners, people who got into the tech and, and, and made it work for, for their customers. Um, but what we found along the way is that uh, some of them are good at selling software and some of them aren't. Right. Some of them are, are good at just selling their services, but some of them uh, are um, and some of them are good at selling both software and services. So the ones that are good at selling software, we want to work with them as resellers. And, and frankly, those those partners uh, tend to. Well, in the case of all partners, you're looking for partners who are going to bring you customers as much as you bring their customers. So if you kind of think about that partner journey, when you're an early stage company, often you'll need partners to, to fill in the gaps in your company that you just don't have the time or resources to fill in right now. So maybe that's geographic coverage, right? So I got a great product, I'm launching, I need to, but I've got customers that want to uh, want to me to have a local presence in, in you know, some other country, let's, let's call it, uh, uh, you know, let's call it Brazil, right? And, and, and none of us here at the company speak Portuguese. I need a partner to cover the geography in, in Brazil. Um, and, and as that moves forward over time, and by the way, those gaps can be geographic gaps. They can be functional gaps, people who are building things that I haven't built yet, people who are, are in territories that I'm not in yet. And, and a lot of the focus verticals is around, too. pardon? Verticals too, right? Verticals. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Verticals too. So, so I need people to be in places I can't be, but where partnerships really get exciting is in the end, when those partners can bring you customers that you wouldn't get to otherwise. So, so in those early days, I'm handing leads to those partners in, in places that I can't be, geography, uh, uh, verticals, uh, et cetera. I'm handing leads to them. And that really kind of kicks off the partnership and gets things going. But there reaches a point where I'm large enough as a company, I've got the, 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 the resources to put boots on the ground in those different geographies. I've got people to, to, to build those functional gaps that I might have. I have people who, who do, who are industry uh, specialists and I'm able to, to service those gaps myself within the company. At that point, I'm shifting gears on the partnership view and saying, okay, I'm looking for you to bring me, bring me customers that I wouldn't be able to find otherwise. And so the, the onus kind of starts shifting. And some of my partners were able to shift with me, right? And some of my partners weren't. Some of my partners that, that were really dependent upon us bringing them leads, frankly, were a little lost when, when, we, when we grew big enough to, to cover all those gaps that I was talking about. But then I have other partners that grew with me. Uh, you called out David Faye. Uh, Faye Business Group is our largest partner worldwide because they made that shift. And, right. and big part of that is they invested in their own marketing. They're bringing me customers that I wouldn't have found otherwise. And it needs to be, it needs to be a two-way street, right? It needs to be a, a, partners, a partnership only works if each side is delivering something that the other side needs. And, but that, that definition of what people need, what the partners needs, that evolves over time. And, and if, if everybody's focused on evolving together, then it's a successful partnership for the long term, 
but it may be that the successful partnership only worked for an early stage period of time. Right. And one more follow on question here in the, the kind of shifting landscape of partner land and direct land, because I know sugar does a ton of business through partners. Whenever you're able to start servicing those geos or verticals or territories that maybe a reseller had more exclusive quote unquote access to, right. You end up with this direct sales organization or customer team are, is, is that in a position today where these resellers can co-sell, so to speak, or run nearby? Absolutely. Plays? We do that every day. Every day, That's right? Big part of, not just know, the walled garden business unit where it's like, oh, partner versus direct. It's like, no, together. How, and, and that's really what um, I think we do something that I have learned is actually somewhat unique out there, which is all of my salespeople co-sell with my partners. There you I don't have them. one organization that sells through partners and the other organization that that sells direct and then uh, and then having to deal with with channel conflict and 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 everybody fighting over the same pie. We 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 saw that out of the gates early as just an unnecessary level of, of friction that would just um, confuse the customer in the end. Right. So we've got every one of my salespeople can can. Uh, if, if it makes sense to work the deal direct with a customer, sometimes the customer works, wants to work exclusively with, with the vendor, uh, or if it makes sense to work uh, a deal with a partner, we're very fluid on that. And, and, and we find that we just stay focused on what works for the customer best is the, is the number one way of, of solving all those different go-to-market model challenges. I, I love that you said, uh, if the customer wants, that's all often gets lost in these discussions. It's yeah. like, should we do it this way? Should we involve partners? Should we not? Let's do whatever way the customer wants. How, how do you solve the potential conflict in terms of compensation and rewards for, you know, partners, reps, like, okay, when does it, when does it count as a partner being involved? Uh, and does, you, you know, who gets like, who gets what in terms of payout or credit? So, so probably where the, the most tension comes into that piece is it's in our partner program, our reseller program, where we will give more margin to a partner when they source the lead. Yep. Right. So, so lead source and who owns the lead source is something that, that we, uh, we spend a lot of time focusing on. We got this great software that helps us keep track of it. It's called sugar CRM, right? So our, <laughs> our own software helps us manage that, that own problem and, and keep it uh, under control. But that's probably the, the main place where it comes into play. You know, we, you we've always, comp, so to speak, reps, right? Yeah. 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 They, they I, I will, I will they... comp a rep for close. If, if a partner, so I think what you're probably getting to, how do I know when the partner has done the bulk of the selling and uh, versus when the, the rep has done the bulk of the selling? I, I purposely choose to ignore that situation because what I find is when you when you focus on the question of does this rep deserve full quota or partial quota because the partner did some of the selling or all of the selling, then you spent a ton of sales management energy focused on something that of just basically managing the bottom line, right? The I, want my, really I want my sales management focused on growing the top line. If my sales management is stressing about managing the bottom line to that level of detail, I got them worrying about things that in the end doesn't really matter. It's not, you know, save a couple of dollars on a particular deal. Eh. Uh, um, I'd rather be working three deals at once as opposed to uh, chasing who deserves what compensation on one deal. I, I love it. I love it. Um, what you just said there was like, that was like the near bound ethos and gospel that I've been, been preaching. It's like, look, bring everyone together, attach partners, whether that's early on source. Great. Give more, give more stuff to the partners that source, right? Align compensation and partner rewards with partners that source, right? A higher you know revenue share. Um, but at the end of the day, partner attaches the metric that matters. You know, co if you cohort revenue, typically what we see across the board is that partner attached pipeline and partner attached revenue tends to have two of three things, right? Two of these three, almost every time higher win rate, faster time to close or higher ACV pick two. You're going to typically find two in that partner cohort. Right. Sales can couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. Once you agree to work with a partner on, on going after a, a deal with a customer, 
you got to just make it easy after that. If, if you're spending all of your time in the course of working with a partner on a deal, trying to measure who's doing more effort, all you're doing is not spending effort solving the customer's problems. You're doing everything you can to lose the deal at that point as opposed to win the deal. So once you agree to do a deal with a partner, then then everybody gets comped, everybody wins together, and 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 we'll hold the partner accountable. If if we feel that the partner is is uh, not pulling their weight in that deal, then we just want to involve them in the next deal. It's as simple as that. But trying to to dissect the the level of effort in each deal that's a that's a that's time not spent winning the deal. That's time that you're taking away from keeping your competitor at bay. That's time that you're not talking to the customer. Those are all formulas for win for losing a deal. This is, I oh, want to clip this. We got to clip this, Isaac. And we got to send this to, there's several sales leaders. I got to clip yeah. this and send, you know, send them to Clint. Uh, well, well, here, I mean, I think Clint has a, Clint has maybe an unfair advantage here because you have that zoomed out perspective as a co-founder. I know you've been chief technology officer, chief marketing officer, your chief strategy officer now, but you have that bigger picture. Like let's zoom out and look at the business as a whole and stop focusing on the little who deserves what credit in this deal. What's better for the business as a whole? Like you said, this is not a one shot game. So deciding who gets the perfect credit for this one deal is less important than what are you going to do moving forward with that partner? If you didn't like them, cool, give them the credit and then whatever, then move on. But if it's working, like let's focus on what's working for customers and getting that top line revenue going. I just, I love that perspective. It's so, so needed and so refreshing to hear. Um, okay. So it's, we're almost done with this podcast. It's 2024. So that means we have to have an obligatory question about AI involved okay. somewhere in <laughs> all the podcast discussions. <laughs> so I'm, I'm curious, um, like your thoughts on AI how far potentially are we away from some pretty serious disruptions? I mean, let's take, let's take just CRMs alone. When you think about, and I'm non-technical, so I always put things in like idiot speak. When you think about what the capabilities of using plain language to, you know, ask a chat bot or something to do something for you that was previously complex. I think a lot about a lot of the things you do in CRMs that, either people who work in RevOps or the solutions partners, they're building dashboards, they're building views, they're putting together, they're, they're doing all these if-then statements and conditionals to, to get you the result you want. And really all you want is to be able to say, hey, can you show me a list of X? Or hey, can you show me all of the people who have this criteria and also this criteria? And you don't want to have to like learn all the operators and all that. How far are we from just that chat interface, that AI sort of chat GPT style I can just go and say what I want, and I'm never actually in the CRM. Startups doing it now. I'm talking to startups that are doing it right now. Very, uh, um, it works. It's super compelling. I mean, high level. Is AI here to stay? Is is AI as real as mobile, or is it going to be kind of a bit of the flash in the pan that social was? And I'm going to say it's every bit as big as mobile. And in fact, I'm going to I'm going to double down and say that it's every bit as big as mobile and cloud as the internet together. I, I think AI is as big of a game changer as the internet was in 1996 when I started building my first uh, uh, web pages and my first web CMS platform that I that my my first employer for some reason allowed me to build while they were paying me to do something else entirely, which got me started on this this uh, uh, journey that I'm on today. It's every bit as big. But it's not going to all unfold in the next 12 months, right? So the way I describe it is think about what, what mobile phone did you have? You probably didn't call it mobile. What, what cell phone did you have in 2004? I was a BlackBerry guy. What did you have in 2004? I, I think that was uh, – I think I had the Nextel still. The Nokia. Nextel Direct Connect. We had a Nokia. Nokia brick phone. The ones that were okay. indestructible. I was all about my email on my BlackBerry, and, and I, was, I was super wed to my, my, my keyboard. It had to be a real keyboard and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then you think about uh, uh, how the market changed in 2008 with the iPhone, and, and, and then you think forward to 2004. 14 and you think of 2024 I, I and you think about what what that phone is for you today 
bit of a dual edged sword. Uh, uh, it, it's the, the supreme distraction advice as much as it is the su supreme productivity device. But that topic aside, I feel like 2024 for AI is like 2004 for the mobile industry. Front end. Lots of cool things happening, but absolute front end with some major disruption coming ahead of us. I'll, I'll take it a step forward. Remember I, I talked about DoorDash and Uber earlier. Do you think DoorDash and Uber could have existed in 2004? It was, that, it was that GPS accurate to within about 10 feet sort of breakthrough. Yeah. Yeah, there was some innovation that needed to happen, and 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 the whole kind of uh, concept of an app ecosystem that that Apple brought to the market. I think a lot of these ideas that we're talking about in terms of that that entirely voice based interface. I think about that that. Uh, by the way, I I don't think voice based interface is going to replace keyboards, mouse, thumbs, gestures. I think it's going to augment it, right? Even to this day. Uh, I still, you know, no matter, how, I spent a ton of time doing this, but I still do this with my, with my mouse and I still do this, right? So the voice based interface is going to have the right place in time uh, in, in your computing experience and it's going to augment. It's not going to completely replace it, but we're still, we're at the front end. That, that's kind of my, my, my short version of all this is we're, we're at the very front end. There's a lot of innovation coming ahead of us. Uh, I think of that world of, you know, because so I, I, I'm a kid. I was born in, in the early 70s, 1971. And so, you know, 1977, when Star Wars came out, I was six years old. And that was that was that shaped everything. It's like, oh, wow, I want, you know, do I want C-3PO or, or do I want R2-D2 next to me? <laughs> <laughs> and of course, you no, know, R2-D2 is my hero. C-3PO is a nerd. Uh, um, but, but, you know, all that aside, we're we're a long way from from these guys running the world, uh, um, and and I think there's a lot of innovation coming ahead of us over the next ten years, the next five you, years, right? You know what's funny, Jared? Uh, a lot of times when there's a new technology that comes on the scene and everyone's hyping it as the next big thing, you'll find this pattern where like all the young people are like, "This is the next big thing," and a lot of the OGs are like, "Eh, let's wait and see. Maybe it's overrated." With AI, all of the OGs that we talk to are like, it's underrated. It's bigger than you think. It's going to disrupt more than you think. Like all the people that have been in the game for a long time, none of them are like, yeah, like they get it. This is, this is a big deal. This, uh, it's just this, so interesting. I think it's bigger than the internet in the end. I think it's going to have a, a bigger change in front of us. I, but I also, you know, so in the end, uh, I believe in a future that looks more like Star Trek than a future that looks like uh, um, uh, Terminator. Right, I, I I am not dystopian. I I am an optimist. Um, I believe in if in and a big part of why I do what I do is to create that future that I want to see in front of us. And I think there's going to be some challenges along the way, no doubt about it. But I I, I truly think that that AI is going to augment the way we live. It's going to it's going to improve the way we live. It's going to you know frankly in the in the very very near term, you think about the fact that that population is growing exponentially. And the demands for a workforce is growing ex is growing even faster than that. Uh, think about the 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 uh, the uh, unemployment rate that we're enjoying right now in the United States. One of the lowest unemployment rates ever. We in in across every industry, we need more productivity. We just need more productivity out of out of our people in order to fuel the 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 economic machine that we all live by. And AI is going to fill that gap. And, and that doesn't mean that we're going to get rid of people at all, right? But it just means we're going to make them more productive. And, and I truly believe that. What an inspiring uh, and aspiring way to close this out. Clint, I share that optimistic view of the world. I want to live in the Star Trek future as well. Um, the only uh, comment I might leave for Isaac and I, and then maybe this is another topic with you down the line, is the problems that AI creates, I think blockchain will come back to be what uh, solves the privacy concerns. So that'll be an interesting one to get back to. I think you're hundred percent right on that one, man. I think blockchain was just 10 years too early. Yep. Yes. We were just talking about this. It was a, it was a solution in search of a problem for a long time. And now the man, we, we found are, the problem. Yeah, the <laughs> problem is going to be AI and blockchain trust. will be the thing that's, you know, yeah, we live in a world where, where AI is eroding trust, but what does blockchain do? It builds trust. I completely yep, yeah. agree.
So that, that, that'll be an interesting, uh, you know, future clairvoyant thing that you heard at first here on the Nearbound podcast. Blockchain will have a direct correlation to the problems that a- blockchain adoption will directly correlate problems that AI creates. But it, right now, there's tons of opportunities for AI to solve many problems. Oh, just I- think about how a blockchain could solve deep fakes. Oh, wow. You, you got me you got me thinking on, <laughs> on the next company idea right there. <laughs> there trust, trust is the new data. So, you know, that's where we're going. Yeah, absolutely. Clint, thank you so much for hopping on the Nearbound podcast and uh, applauds. Uh, you know, I want to applaud you and the Sugar team for being one of the first companies to actually launch products and solutions that actually have AI in them. Um, if y'all haven't checked it out, definitely go check it out on the Sugar website because I thought they were one of the first companies to actually do yeah. that in an interesting way. And, and check out the the Fueling Growth podcast as yes. well. That's right. Check us out on Fuel Growth. Uh, you'll find us on every one of the the podcast services where we're interviewing uh, executives about how they're driving growth in their companies. Yeah, uh, shout out. Uh, Jill Rowley was just on it. So you'll see that come up in one of uh, your podcasts as well. She's a, a fan and friendly uh, over here at Nearbound. Um, Clint, appreciate you. Nearbound, we'll see you around. Until next time on the Nearbound podcast.